Hello and welcome to The Box On Screen. I'm at the stunning start point in South Devon, an area of outstanding natural beauty and home to the iconic Start Point Lighthouse. It's been guiding mariners safely around this stretch of coastline for over 150 years, but more on that later. Today, our focus is on climate change. Scientists first started warning of the impacts of greenhouse gases in the late 19th century. And in the 1960s, evidence of the dangerous effects of the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was starting to be taken seriously. Extreme weather events began to be reported frequently on the news from the 1960s, and the increase in those events was starting to be attributed to global warming. So today I'm here with Hayley Herridge, a conservation officer from the Life on the Edge project, which is supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Now, Hayley, you've been helping me to dive into the archive to pick out clips that, that talk to climate change through the decades. But before we look at those clips, can you just tell me a little bit about the Life on the Edge project? Yeah, sure. So the, the project aims to restore viable, healthy populations of some of the UK's rarest uh, and threatened invertebrate and plant species down here on the South Devon coast. So we're working between Berryhead and Wembury, uh, where we have one of the last remaining colonies of the six-banded nomad bee, uh, Mediterranean oil beetle, grey bush cricket and plants such as the Goldilocks aster, um, a slender birdsfoot trefoil and autumn squill. So Hayley, how does the project restore and maintain these local habitats? So we're working with local communities basically to put the wildflowers back. So we want to create a robust, connected network of wildflower rich habitat. And why is it so important that, that we do that? In the face of climate change, uh, it's really important because invertebrates are incredibly vulnerable to climatic changes. So by creating a connected network of habitats, we're enabling those species to, to find suitable conditions that they require. Let's take a look at a clip from the 1970s, a time when climate change was just beginning to be discussed in the news. Ian, we're talking about a world in crisis. Do you think it is in a crisis? I think it is, yes. I think we're heading for possibly a major climatic change in the next few years, maybe much sooner than we imagine, um, of such a nature that it may in fact end our food supply and end our whole civilization. What's causing this climatic change? Well, the essence of it seems to be the build-up of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This graph shows the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere during this century. And as you can see, it's a, it's a rapid rate of increase. It's called an exponential curve. And the rate of increase is itself increasing. Now, this region here is a projection. And as you can see, that's very alarming indeed. But what effect does that have? Well, the effect it has is of a warming. It's called the greenhouse effect. And this has been known about for a really quite a long time, for 25 years or so. The end result might be a melting of the polar ice caps. This, this theory has been banded about and talked about by people for quite a long time. But there are other theories now. One is that we could get a, a sudden overheating due to loss of our tropical rainforests. Say, if this happened, say, by the end of the century, we could get air temperatures of about 50 degrees centigrade building up, which would make life totally impossible. I remember when I was growing up, and the idea of melting ice caps and extreme temperatures always seemed to be a thing that, that was far in the future. Yes, I know, and it feels like climate change is really with us now, particularly as we're experiencing kind of extreme storms in winter, odd, odd weather in spring, you know, droughts or extreme flooding, and then long, hot, sort of drier summers, which is why I feel like the Life on the Edge project, you know, it's so important that it happens now because we need to create a more robust, resilient landscape that can cope with these extreme weathers. Absolutely. Now, before we move on to our next clip, I'm really keen to go and see if we can find some of these extraordinary creatures. And, you know, they've got such a big role to play. Should we go and find some? Yes, yes, let's go and have a look. So, Hayley, the study of entomology. What is it? And, and why <laughs> okay. do we need a net? Well, entomology is the, the study of insects. And when you're out in the field, um, you quite often use a net to, to capture um, insects uh, because 
they're moving so fast, you can't get to see them properly without getting them in the net. And then you can put them in a pot and have a really close look at them to be able to identify them correctly. Okay. So hopefully we'll, we'll find something now for you to have a look at. And that's the idea of the pot, isn't it? That you get to just have a closer look at some of these species. Yeah, absolutely. Suddenly the, uh, the various kind of details of the, of, the, of the creature you're looking at suddenly come to life when you can see them in a pot. Amazing. Wow. Next, we're going to look at a story that focuses on the nearby village of Bee Sands. And here we have a clip from our archive, which looks at a particularly violent storm in 1969. Well, I slept in the house that night till four o'clock in the morning. And then I got up because I knew it was, the sea was so bad against bashing against the house that uh, it, something was happening it would be unsafe to stay. How frightened were you? Well, I was terribly frightened. What's going to happen to the house now? Will you go on living here? Well, I would like to, but I, I can't not if we don't get a seawall because it's unsafe. Now, that clip really does show the impact that severe weather can have on communities and people. Yes, I think that's a real sort of extreme example, isn't it, of life on the, on the edge there. Um, further along the coast, though, in other places, and sort of in the context of, of wildlife, um, we have increased kind of pressures from climate change and, and other, other factors as well. So that's why life on the edge project is really important in terms of putting that habitat back and, and just relieving some of those pressures that wildlife face. I couldn't agree more and honestly thank you Hayley for spending some time with us today. Oh, thank you very much for having me along. Now for our final clip we return to the iconic Start Point Lighthouse and I found a clip from our archive from 1992 which marked the end of an era here. It stood as a monument to Victorian Gothic architecture since 1836. It's also stood as a guide and help to sailors along this, one of the most exposed of English coastlines. Philip Griffiths is the end of the line. 29 years in the service of Trinity House, he will see his job taken over by the technology of the 1990s. Phil, that's what it's all about, the lamp. That's 1,500 watts, but uh, how much is that worth? Well, I've been given a quote from one of our engineers of 200 pounds for a replacement of one of these. But in fact, it's rather, uh, should I say, important to, for you to note that these lamps, projector lamps, are no longer manufactured. So in other words, they're a priceless, uh, a priceless commodity for Start Point Lighthouse because with automation due up, I haven't got very many of these left in stock. So you have to guard them like the crown jewels. What a lovely clip. No keepers at home anymore, but still the lighthouse shines brightly. And thank you for joining me for the box on screen. Check out our other content on our YouTube channel, or why not visit us at the box where you can see more from our incredible film archive. <laughs>